Now, tributes continue to pour in for the Speaker of South Africa's first Democratic Parliament, Feni Jinwala. Now, the ANC veteran died at home on Thursday evening at the age of 90 after suffering a stroke two weeks ago. Jinwala has been held for her role in building an inclusive parliament. I'm joined now by a former secretary of the National Assembly, Mr. Kamal Mansura. Thank you so much, Mr. Kamal Mansura, for joining me this evening. Now, of course, I think for somebody who's worked with um, Freni and who knew her on some personal level maybe as well, you know, what, what are some of the fondest memories that you can share with us? Yes, thank you very much for having me. It, it was really a pleasure working with uh, Speaker Jinwala. Uh, from 1994, of course, when she came in, I was fortunate enough to be at Parliament to, uh, to be at what we call the table of the National Assembly when uh, Speaker Jinwala was elected the first Speaker. And of course, on the same day, you will recall that uh, President Mandela was elected the President of the country. Uh, my fondest memory of uh, Speaker Jinwala is her firstly, for the first thing that came to mind, of course, when she became Speaker. We advised her then, I was part, of course, of the procedural staff at Parliament, and we advised her that she needs to get into a robe. You will uh, recall from the Westminster system, all speakers are robed when they take the chair. And Speaker Jinwala, of course, refused to be robed. She said, I will not be robed. I will sit in this chamber in my sari with my white hair so that the public can recognize that the people are in charge of this parliament. So they will see a lady in a sari sitting there and conducting the proceedings of the house. And she said, you, Mr. Mansura, you and your staff can look the uh, the, the, the clever ones sitting there with your robes in front of us and advising us. But we are the people and we are leading the people and we are the people's parliament, so I will not be robed. So that was my first encounter with the speaker moving away from Westminster tradition of being a robed speaker to being an unrobed speaker. And uh, I think that's followed and we have never had a speaker that has been robed in parliament since. Um, that was one of the first, first encounters that we knew that we were moving away from a Westminster style of, uh, of, of government, uh, of parliament, into what we call Africanization of parliament. And that's what Speaker Jinwala brought in very, very strongly. Another, another fond one I recall is that she, she, when we told her, we're going to need a portrait of you so that you can be hung on the walls of parliament. And she told us then, I will never be a hung, a hung speaker. <laughs> so uh, you will uh, know that in Parliament, we had on the walls of Parliament the previous speakers. But she took the standpoint that she will never be a hung speaker. So that, that, that were some of the anecdotal things that we went through with Speaker Jinwala. And of course, in reconstructing the whole parliamentary system uh, to be all the rules and orders in Parliament to be in line with the Constitution. Uh, she was one of the speakers who took the floor of the House. When we advise a strongly speaker, you are the speaker. You sit in the chair of the House. You don't take part in debate. She said, nonsense, nonsense, Kamal. I take part in debate. I am part of the people. And she left the chair, she left the chair, and she went onto the floor of the House and participated in debate and even initiated debate mm. in, uh, in the first parliaments. So it was a shock to us, the way uh, Speaker Jinwala changed the whole rules of the Westminster system to make it an African system of, uh, an African parliamentary system. Mm. And uh, that came to us as a great shock being steeped in Westminster tradition. Mm. Very important that you, you, you said there, she took part in the debate Yet, when we, you know, from, from all the, the, the people that we've heard, you know, um, the, so far, the, the, the one thing that also stands out is that so many political parties still had so much respect for her, even though she was part of the debate, she was part of, you know, the conversations, but yet most political parties still say that she was fair in what she did in Parliament. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, certainly. 
uh, she took part in the debate to give direction mm. to some debates. She sometimes felt that Parliament wasn't debating the issues it should be debating. And she therefore gave direction. She certainly was one of those speakers who would you, who would you call a very, very fair, fair speaker. She was more interested in implementing the new constitution than living in the old system where the majority rules without, uh, without oversight and accountability. And she dissected the new constitution, especially section 70, uh, 55 of the constitution, to say, when we say in our constitution that the National Assembly shall hold the executive accountable and oversee accountable action, what does it mean? And she actually uh, commissioned a study in that regard. Uh, it was headed by, I remember, uh, Professor Hugh Corder from the University of, uh, uh, of Cape Town, uh, who carried out a, uh, who, who developed a paper for us on what is accountability, what is oversight, and how do these mechanisms come into place? She saw through the party lines and she saw we have a constitution that we must implement. And therefore, the importance of the constitution was upmost in Speaker Jinwala's mind. Mm. Um, is, is it something you, you, you would say might even be lacking in, in Parliament now? Uh, we have developed a system that uh, the executive is very much stronger than Parliament at the moment. And when Speaker Jinwala was there, of course, she insisted on the autonomy of Parliament. She took on ministers in a great number of ways. And I think it was because of the support she had from uh, from uh, uh, President Mandela then and and the whole hierarchy of the ANC to say we need a parliament that must conduct oversight over us and they encourage the whole uh, system the whole ANC culture then was we are accountable to the people maybe we've developed systems then that that works then. We are now into a very, very different sort of a parliament now. We're actually into a very conflictual parliament. Uh, uh, a, it becomes nasty at times, as you know. Mm. Um, there are, uh, uh, it, it's, it's become more than robust. It's become uh, unruly at times. And uh, therefore, we need now to develop 20 years on, we need to develop parliamentary procedures that suits the time better. Mm. Of course, yeah, the country has changed so much um, um, in that regard. Um, I wonder if she, um, what her, how she would have handled, you know, much of Parliament, what's happening in Parliament today. Um, that would, would have been interesting to see. But, you know, you also said she called it, of course, the People's Parliament. That's so important. Um, why do you think she emphasized that so much? Because that's like a, a running th theme throughout everything that we know about Freeni Jinwala is she called it the People's Parliament. Why do you think it was so important for her to do that? Well, remember, we came from a what was called uh, the old order. And the old order, we talk about representative government, where you elect a, your representative and you leave your representative to run the country on your behalf. Uh, the whole parliamentary and democracy, uh, democracy of the world has changed since then. And I think South Africa was the leading force of this with our constitution, where we say, starting off uh, with the people shall govern. And they took that very, very literally. The speaker shall govern. You will not only govern through a representative of yours who you elect once every five years, but you will be involved in every aspect of the development of your democracy, of the services that, that, that are offered to you. And I think uh, that's where the People's Parliament came in there. And uh, she was always uh, of the view that the people must come into Parliament, they must see how Parliament mm. works, they must be involved in the work of Parliament. And that was the culture that came through then, that the rest of the world, I think, caught up with us many years later. Mm. Uh, I think Yes, I, I'd like to share with you just another short uh, uh, um, anecdote 
of what happened when the speaker went to China in one of her visits. And she came back with maps of the world. And on that map of the world that China had in its archives, so the, uh, the, it, wa it was an upside down map where Africa was at the top of the map and Europe was at the bottom of the map. You know, we're so used to seeing Europe at the top of the map and, and Africa at the bottom of the map that we all accept it as such. And she came back with this map from China, uh, probably in the 15th century or so, where Africa was on the top of the map. And uh, she had those maps kept at Parliament and displayed in Parliament. And uh, she made a very big deal of these maps that she found that, that placed Africa in the context of being mm -hmm. uppermost in the world rather than in the bottom of the world. That was very, very interesting for, to me. I love that you said that because it, I also agree with this sentiment um, that the Council for the Advancement of the Constitution shared and where she was actually a founding uh, member um, of the organization's advisory council and they described her as fiercely independent minded women who would never sacrifice her principles on the altar of expediency. But also just to touch on that and what you just mentioned, you know, I think as a young person and also for many young South Africans, especially when you, when you talk about these Gen Z generations who might not even know who Freni Genwala is, um, how important is it for us as South Africa to remember Freni and the role that she played, but also um, how, how do we carry on her legacy to make sure that what she fought for and what she stood for carries on? You know, that's very, very difficult. You know, we, we were always told in our later years in Parliament that, uh, as you know, that uh, 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 there must be room now for the younger generation. There must be room for different thinking. So uh, the generation of the Jinwalas, the Madivas, uh, the Mbekis, I think it's, it is a dying generation. And we're trying to hold on to as much as we can through training, development, uh, remembrance, books. But it is a hard battle going forward. Mm. It is a hard battle. I think it, it is a renewal that we are looking for. Uh, and uh, it is not it is not an easy road to be traveled. I, I think especially uh, with the youth of today uh, and uh, the new values, the new systems. I mean, if you look at technology and where we are going and how quick uh, news moves across the world, uh, it, it's a far cry from what we had 20, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's a new sort of democracy uh, we can take the fundamental values of the past, the fundamental values of the Jinwalas and the Bekis and the Mandelas. But uh, we have to also realize that we are on our way out. I'm on mm. my way out. People who were here for the last 25 years are on their way out. We can talk, we can record uh, uh, our experiences and the ethical values that we took through. But I think we can't own the future. We can advise now on the future, but it's for the younger generation now to own their own future answers. But well, fortunately, at least. Thank you so much, Mr. Mansoura, for, for joining me this evening. Um, uh, very interesting and loved our conversation. Thank you so much. Of course, that was the retired secretary to the National Assembly, Mr. Kamal Mansoura, just sharing his experiences with the late Freni Janwala. Um,